Welcome to another episode of The Shredder Show. Today, we have, I'm going to call him King Shredder himself from the UK, uh, <laughs> um, Mr. Mike Thurston. So today is a big pleasure to have you on the podcast. So thank you very much for your time, firstly. I think everyone will probably know who Mike is if you're into the fitness scene. So Mike is probably the OG of fitness YouTube from the UK. And I think one of the things I always loved about you and what you've done is you have your own very unique style in terms of what you do and you don't really copy anyone else and your lifestyle is very different in that respect. So you're very forward thinking that. Mm-hmm. One of the big things I want to talk to you about today though is how I think you've matured something a lot very quickly and the plans of what you're doing going forward and how you're developing as a person. So yeah. firstly, what do you think is that's driving this change within you right now? Well, I think first of all, <laughs> I'm not getting any younger. So I'm now 32 and I think when I got into my 30s, I turned 31, 32, I realized, okay, I can't keep behaving and acting the way I was when I was in my you know, mid 20s, later 20s, when I kind of started YouTube. So. I think as I just naturally matured with age, the type of content which I want to put out will again sort of just naturally mature. So I think beforehand I was going around doing a lot of vlogs, lifestyle stuff, and just trying to do things to entertain people. Whereas now that doesn't really fulfill me as much. I'd rather be the type of person that is helping people and putting out meaningful content. And it, that was actually what I did to begin with when I started YouTube. Like all my content was literally just helping people build muscle, lose body fat. And then I kind of strayed away from that because I kind of got bored with it. And then I got more into lifestyle of vlogging. So I felt like I had to entertain people more. But now I'm getting a little bit more f- kind of bored with that. And I'm trying to retract back to sort of the self-help stuff. And I think as well, it's the past the past couple of years, I really have had a lot of fun pretty much doing whatever I want, when I want. I've I feel like in my mid-20s, I really grafted to kind of get myself out there, build my channel and my revenue streams. And then I got to a point where I was like, you know what? I actually just want to enjoy my life for a little bit because all these things which I wanted to do when I was younger, I could now do because I had a bit of money and I had free time to do it. So um, I kind of did all those things. I I, I lived sort of the, the hedonistic lifestyle, partied quite a bit, traveled. And then I think when you do that too much of that, you start to realize, oh, actually, it's not really that fulfilling. And I think I came to that realization, I guess it was even like the start of this summer, I think. I think a lot of the things which I used to love doing, I just don't really enjoy doing it anymore. I remember it was on, it was when the, the nightclubs opened again in Ibiza. And I've spent the past two summers in Ibiza. And I went in May, group of friends, and Hi, the, the biggest or the, the best rated nightclub had opened up again. So I was like, oh my God, yes, it's going to be great. Can't wait. It's been two years since it's been opened. And I was there on the dance floor and I was just kind of like, oh, this is actually pretty average. Don't really enjoy this anymore. So I think that kind of was an indicator that I should be doing something else now. Random, which came to my head. Do you feel that sometimes like, the girls were staying the same age and you just kept getting older and you're getting that older guy who's like hanging around? You suddenly notice people are younger than you? Because even I see, I don't go out, but I see that sometimes in the fitness scene. Yeah. Like people are 10 years younger than me. I'm like, interesting. Well, I, I definitely noticed that with the, the, the guy friends who I was hanging out with, particularly in Ibiza, they were all younger than me. And they were, I, I guess they were just at a different stage in life to where I am now. I think they're kind of where I was four years ago. So they're doing their thing, they're enjoying themselves, but I've kind of I've surpassed that stage. But I think especially now, I, I still go to parties and events where I'm s- surrounded by people who are a kind of similar age group, which is it's quite good. I think if I ever go to a party and I'm the oldest one there, then I, that is quite a worrying situation. But luckily that hasn't been too frequent. Other than obviously what you said in terms of um, that moment in Ibiza, has there been anything else that's really like penny drop? You're like, I don't want to be involved with this anymore. Because I think... Something you said there that was very interesting. It's almost like how you come back to your real values of who mm-hmm. you are in terms of like, like you probably feel like you're on this like planet to help people. Like your original content was helping people get in great shape. And then it became people loved you and your lifestyle so you just start showing your lifestyle. And it's interesting how you got bored of that and now you want to go back to like, how can I help like inspire and motivate people and actually teach them at the same time? I think it's a number of things. I think... Um Particularly this summer, I had a lot of a lot more time to myself than usual. So I was listening to a lot of podcasts. And even if I wasn't necessarily physically surrounded by the right people, if you listen to podcasts and watch the right videos, it's it's almost kind of a similar thing because you're constantly filling your head with good information. So you're naturally just improving your thoughts and getting motivated by those people who are quite inspiring and who have set a very good example. And then I guess it comes down to purpose as well. If, if you ask yourself, well, what is your purpose? I felt like what I was doing over the past few years, it wasn't very fulfilling. And I felt like, well, this isn't really what I'm supposed to do here. 
If, if my purpose is to help people, to motivate them, inspire them, then these videos, maybe they are like the travel vlogs, it inspires people to kind of, you know, live their dream life or whatever and travel. But I felt like it wasn't quite what I was supposed to be doing. And I think most importantly, I, I just felt like I was capable of a lot more, like especially at this stage, I've done the hard work, I've built the platform and I feel like that there is so much more that I can achieve but I became quite comfortable and content with where I was at that I kind of I took a bit of time off. I, I did the things which I wanted to do, which I guess is, is, is a good thing to do. But then I just, I was just thinking, come on, like I, there's more I could be doing. There's more content I could be putting out. Like the, the, the work rate was nowhere near what it could be. So um, yeah, I was just thinking, well, this is just not my potential. So let's try and actually fulfill that potential. Do you find like, and I see a lot of people on social media, like with YouTube in particular, you're almost having to like, fulfill an alter ego of like fulfilling who Mike Thurston is, but like going to beach clubs, hearing my abs, yeah. look at my sushi, like that sort of persona. Yeah, yeah, particularly with, um, with the vlogs that I do, I, I put on a bit of a character. It's not like anything too different, but it's kind of like more uh, animated and energetic just because you have to, I'm, I'm naturally quite a chilled out guy who's I guess more on the introverted side because sometimes I wake up and I'm like, I really don't want to make a video today. But I'm like, I have to make a video. So I have to sort of go out there, do something interesting, put on like the 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 show. And even though that's, I don't feel as though it's necessarily the, the, the person that I am, I feel like that's, I need to continue to be that person for the viewers, if you know what I mean. So I don't know, it's, it's I, I, like, I still have that character within me, but I still think sometimes people don't really know the real me. And, and, and sometimes I feel a bit lost because I have, I felt like I've lost, uh, or, or being confused with who I actually am as a person sometimes. So it's, it's, it, I think this summer, as I mentioned, I had a bit of time out to rethink, okay, well, who I am, what, what you know, type of person am I and what content do I want to put out there? It's interesting you mentioned you being very introvert, like naturally, because I'm exactly the same. Mm. And the people, I'm an introvert, but I've learned to be extrovert. And I think you're exactly the same. And ironically, we both trained in the same gym in the UK for a long time for Seat Warehouse. I never spoke to you. Because, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm like, unless I know someone, and particularly back then, I've never talked to or engaged with anyone because I was like a very shy guy. So, I mean, doing podcasts and YouTube and all that stuff wasn't what I wanted to do. Mm. For anyone out there who's listening to this or watching this, how did you overcome that hurdle and teach yourself to become extrovert and like turn on like the Mike Thurston switch when you need to? I think uh, the YouTube definitely had a, a big part to play with that. I think naturally I was I was uncomfortable being in front, of, speaking in front of the camera. So I knew if, if I wanted to take my career to the next level, okay, I have to make myself known on this platform, YouTube. Because I knew I, I had the knowledge, but it was just a matter of getting it out there. So I used to practice in front of um, the camera. I'd ask myself questions, I'd speak to it. I look back at it. I would edit the footage. Obviously, the first few drafts, I'd be like, "Oh my god!" Like, who's this awkward, weird guy? But then I got better over time. And then naturally, the, the more that you speak in front of the camera, the more you hear yourself talk and watch yourself back. And even the, you know, just your ability to answer. You, you just write down those questions, answer the questions. You naturally get better at answering questions and speaking. So that helped massively. And then just forcing yourself to go out and to network. Because there's some times when, especially back in the day, I'd get invited to events and I'd be like, this is like, this is the last thing that I want to do. I just want to stay at home and just chill out and then just go to bed. But no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna force myself to go out. And every time that I went to an event or where there was loads of people, I had to do loads of speaking. At the end of it, I was really happy and I got a buzz off it. So I think you just have to know that before the initial, uh, whatever it might be, the gathering or the event, you're always going to not want to do it, but there'll always be that feeling of like excitement and satisfaction once you have done it and you feel like, do you know what, that was that was really worth it. But if it always happens at the same time, always before the event, I'm like, oh God, I don't want to do this. I just want to be alone and just like go to the beach or do something by myself. It's funny because I feel exactly the same about most things most of the time, like filming content and like whatever. I I'd rather just train on my own or I would rather do my own thing. But when you push yourself out of the comfort zone and you actually do the thing you're supposed to do, it makes you feel so much more yeah. rewarded. And like afterwards, you're like, why did I, why was I stressing out about this for no reason? Yeah. Like doing a podcast with Mike, he's a nice guy. He's not going to give me shit, I hope. Like it's that sort of thing. You you build up these false expectations in your head of like people are going to give you crap. Like, I know you spoke at our good friend Mark Cole's event recently and you said public speaking was a big thing you wanted to try and learn and push on. Mm -hmm. Like that for you, I imagine is very uncomfortable. It was for me when I started doing that as well. And I think that's where growth comes is continually pushing yourself to like, how can I make myself uncomfortable to keep improving? Yeah. And you, you just, it doesn't matter how you feel, you just, you just have to do it. Like even if there's days where you're like, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't want to film today. Or I don't want to do this. 
just do it. And every time you do it, you always feel amazing afterwards. So I'm all, like I said before, I'm always just thinking of the feeling that I'm going to have after I've done that thing that I don't really want to do. It's the same when I go to the gym, especially like leg, leg days. You know, leg days are never pleasant. And if you want to continue to grow your legs, you have to really push yourself. It's going to be a really uncomfortable one hour. But once you've done that and you really have given 100% effort, you feel amazing afterwards. So I'm, before the session, I always think about how I'm going to feel after the session. And that's great perspective you have. And I think a saying I always like really like is that um, doing things you hate like you love it. And like just like pushing yourself through those things and the mm -hmm. fulfillment that comes of like when you really don't want to do cardio or you don't want to train or you don't want to make that awkward phone call for work or whatever it might be. Like mm. it's the, always the like the fear of doing it is worse than actually doing whatever it is. Yeah. And you got to think if you're not going to do it then someone else is going to do it. There's going to be loads of other people that are going to do the things that you don't want to do. And if they do it, then they're going to overtake you. So you just, you have to suck it up and crack on. What are you doing to stop being overtaken? Is that something that you worry about sometimes with like <laughs> young kids coming up on the block on YouTube or whatever it might be? Yeah, recently, I guess that's one of the things that's made me change a little bit over the past summer. I think now, because it is so easy to make money online, grow your own business. And if you want, really want to work at it, you can grow your social media. And I think it's, I'm not necessarily that bother about people getting like a, a big following or bigger following than me but it's when i find out there's people that are like 10 years younger than me that are making so much more money than me i'm like what the hell like how how has this happened how have i allowed this to happen in the first place there's a guy uh i met him i've met him a few times recently iman yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, name, man, yeah. this guy's like 22 years old and he's worth like tens of millions already and he's just like killing it in every way. And I'm like, what the hell? Like, how has this guy got to such a high level and accomplished so much in life at the age of 22? And I'm 32. And I feel like, damn, like I've, I'm falling behind a bit here. Like I'm doing something wrong. I need to be focusing on something else. But what's really ironic at this, I've been binging his content the last week or two. And like, I watched a lot of his stuff and I feel exactly the same. And I don't know if you get this, like respectfully, I say we're both successful in what we do. It almost makes me feel a bit insecure like I've failed a little bit. I don't mm -hmm. know if you get that in some respects. Like you're 10 years younger than me. What am I doing? Yeah. But I think the younger kids have definitely had a head start because yeah. when we were 22, there wasn't nowhere near the same amount of content out there. I think there was Instagram. At the, when, when I was 22, I don't think there was videos. There was no stories on Instagram. YouTube videos, they, they were there, but they weren't like at the same level in terms of like the, the quality of the production and the edits and so on. And um, so for sure, the, if, if we wanted to learn something, there was a lot less content on YouTube to learn from. So we would have to maybe go and read books or go to seminars. And that was pretty much it. Now, there is so much information out there that is put together so well and so easy to digest that if you are a teen or you're in your early 20s, you know, the, the, all you have to do is just sit there and just binge watch everything and you can learn so much. And you've got pretty much a, a head start so yeah it's i guess that's one thing but I, I wouldn't necessarily feel as though i'm a failure but i think it's a good thing to just surround yourself with those types of people because if i didn't know they existed then again i would just i would feel too comfortable again i'd feel like oh well i'm the most successful person in you know this room or this area but now recently particularly in dubai dubai is a great place to be inspired and motivated i'm making a, a conscious effort to actually spend more time with these people who are very successful and they've made lots of money because even just going to i went to dinner with a couple of guys last night who they've got their their own courses agencies things like that it's i mean i'm baffled by how much money they've been able to make but some of the principles which they've used to make money i can also replicate and uh, you know implement it with some of my own future products, which I bring out. And I think that's where it's an eye-opening. And it's, I think that's where, in a lot of respects, I've moved to Dubai start of this year. You moved out a couple of years ago. And I think moving from the UK to somewhere like Dubai is very eye-opening in that respect in terms of if you can be big fish, small pond in the UK, but you come to Dubai, you're not flexing on people about like having a Rolex watch or whatever car you've got, because there's always somebody who's got like, who's a million times wealthier than you or more successful. And I think that gives you a lot of perspective. And I think some people, depending on their character, either makes them feel bad, or if probably if you're like you and me, it makes you feel super motivated thinking like, fuck me, that's a level of like what can be done like look what he's done i can do that if he could do that yeah and i have i've always had that uh, view on anybody who is more successful than me if someone's got you know a better physique than me and i never hate i'm never bitter i'm always just like like respect 
Like I, I, I know what it's taken to get to that point and I admire that and it, it's motivating me. And it's like, you know, someone like Andrew Tate, like when I watch some of his content, not one point did I feel insecure or jealous or hatred towards him. I was just like, do you know what? Fair play. Like he's, you know, he's, he's, he's telling the cold, hard truth. And even I would get inspired or a bit of a kick up the arse just from listening to some of his rants about just becoming, you know, a, a higher value man and just stop wasting your time and start working more. Do you think people like that's had a very positive influence on you respectfully stop wasting your time with like maybe like the beach club bullshit and all that sort of stuff and like for you to really try and like level up with what you want in life? I think so, but it's, it's weird because somebody can tell you that that has no real meaning and that eventually it gets boring. But I feel like you just, you have to experience it for yourself. You know, there's, there's so many things in my life where I've thought, oh, I'd love to know what that's like. Uh, you know, whether it be, you know, going on holiday with a girl or experiencing this particular adventure or holiday or whatever it might be, or doing something. And a lot of the times when you actually end up doing them, it's, it's nowhere near as good as you thought it would be. And you're just like, oh, okay, that was a bit of a letdown. Oh, well, on to the next thing. And I think with a lot of the stuff which uh, is along the sort of hedonistic sort of lifestyle, it's fun, but it gets boring quick. But no matter how many people, you know, if they tried to tell me that, I would probably ignore them. I'd just be like, yeah, okay, cool. I'm going to go and do it anyway. And then by doing it, I've experienced it. And now I'm like, okay, I don't want to do this anymore. And that's what comes when I was saying at the beginning of this in terms of you maturing, which when I heard you speak of marketing, I was like, bang, I can see that straight away now. And that's mm -hmm. where you go through these experiences in life and like people tell you things aren't cr what they're cracked up to be. Yeah. An amazing book, I don't know if you've read it, is uh, Happy Sexy Millionaire by Stephen Bartlett. And he talks about like when you have money, you've got abs, when you live in sunny Dubai, you'll be like the happiest man in the world. But it, like, you've got those things. Like, it doesn't necessarily lead to complete happiness and fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Like with you, for example, what brings you happiness and fulfillment in that respect? I think now it's knowing that I'm helping people, a sense that I'm creating something. I like to create. So even if it's just creating some form of content, usually if, when I put together like a really good YouTube video, which I'm proud of, that makes me really happy. Uh, doing something which I've found to be difficult or it's an obstacle and I've felt like, okay, let me just, how am I going to, you know, overcome this obstacle or how am I going to accomplish this difficult task when you do it it feels really satisfying like you've accomplished the goal so that's why it's so important to have these little goals and just tick them off you know progressively set new goals and so on so you feel like you're actually achieving something um, and just knowing that I myself am developing and uh, I'm growing as a person so I'm becoming you know more intelligent more experienced wiser I feel like when I go through, you know, I've had phases, say, for example, you know, just like a typical summer 2020 or 2021. I basically didn't read any books, didn't listen to any podcasts, just had fun and did what I want. I felt like from the beginning of the summer compared to the end of summer, had I really grown as a person in terms of the knowledge which I'd acquired? Not really. You could argue I've experienced a lot, like it was good life experience, but I felt like I didn't really create anything. I maybe put out about three or four YouTube videos and that was pretty much it. Had my business grown, had I, you know, uh, literally done anything which I felt like was a decent achievement to make. And I look back and I thought, oh, well, no, not really. And that was kind of a bit, I wouldn't say depressing because I, I don't think I've ever got to the point where I've felt like actually physically depressed. But you do just kind of feel a bit flat. Like there was no s sense of achievement. There. No substance to it. Yeah. Will you do the Ibiza summer thing again next year? No. Well, I mean, even this this summer that has just passed, I hadn't really had a plan of where I'd go and what I would do. But even just having, I went there in May just to kind of see what it was like. And I just thought, well, pff, I'm not doing this again. Like, <laughs> as beautiful and as an amazing island that it is, it is so dangerous to live there. Like, you you have to have a lot of discipline and willpower to just stay away from the party scene. And everybody, like nobody has, goes to Ibiza to do work and to grow their business. The people that either go there are absolute sesh heads or are the people that have actually achieved something and they've made their millions and then they want to go and have fun and spank it all. 
So I found like it was just one of the worst places where I could do work and be productive. So uh, this summer just passed. I'd, I guess because of the pandemic, there was this lack of uh, travel, you know, from 2020, 2021. It was such a pain in the ass to go to places. So this summer I was like, do you know what? I want to actually go see a couple of places which I haven't seen for a while. And that was good. But again, I've realized how just the constant travel and staying in different Airbnbs, different hotels, it's really time consuming. It's really hard to get into a good routine. And because you're in a new place for a limited amount of time, you're like, well, I have to see this place. I have to do all these things whilst I'm here for the next few days. So you actually don't really end up doing a huge amount of work at all. Maybe take some nice pictures and some good content for the vlog, but that's it. It's funny because I remember we, I was talking about that uh, Mark's event and that's one of the things I struggle with a lot is whenever I'm traveling, I almost feel guilty as well because I'm not working. I'm trying to enjoy where I am, but I feel guilty I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And it almost becomes a bit of an anxious situation where I'm trying to like balance the two. Yeah. And I'm exactly the same as you in terms of I love like structure and routine. Do you find Dubai here is the best place for you for that? Yeah. And I, I guess when I first moved here, it was probably a different scenario because when I first came to Dubai, I mean, I mean you got to understand this city is built to entertain and impress people. So when you come here for the first time, you're just like, oh my God, like there's so many things to do. Like every, the sun's out every single day. There's all these beach clubs, all these tourist destinations. And for, for the first, I think for the first year, even though I was, I was getting work done, I was definitely distracted by all the, the entertainment which Dubai has to offer. But now I'm, I'm approaching being here for three years and the novelty of being here has definitely worn off. Like I've literally done everything. There's a couple of things maybe which I haven't done, but I look outside now and I'm like, yeah, okay, well, it's, it, this it doesn't interest me. I've already done it before. So now I have a, a much greater ability to actually just stay at home and do what needs to be done. And I still get invited out, you know, almost on a daily basis to go to places or to meet up for a coffee or to go for dinner. But now my ability to say no is a lot better than it used to be because I just know there's so many things which just take up so much of your time so I ask myself is this really going to be useful is this really going to be helpful and if it's not I'm just like well no it's funny because that's the greatest skill I think is you become more successful is learning to say no to more things because you must get it all the time you get yeah. everyone's got a fucking idea of what you should do like I know Mike Thurston supplements I bet you've heard that about a million times oh, yeah. it's like do you understand how complicated that would be and saying no to those things is more important than saying yes to like anything yeah for sure. And I mean, yeah, it's, it's a situation now where I have all these different ideas and things which I want to do, but I, I know I, I'm, if I try to do more things, I spread myself thin over all the things which I'm already doing at the moment, which are working for me. So I have to be very particular with what I am spending my time on, for sure. Do you set yourself specific goals? Do you have like, next three months I want to do this, and year's time I want to be doing this, by 35 I want to do this? Not necessarily, because I've noticed that every year what it is that I want to do changes quite a bit. As you know, like, I remember the... Even the year when I moved to Dubai, at the start of that year, I had no intention of moving to Dubai. It was only, I guess, at the, summer t the, the summertime, a couple of months before I actually moved to Dubai, where I thought, you know what, I think I'm going to move to Dubai. So I know each year I change quite a bit and my goals change quite a bit. I usually have, uh, I did this this year, I had my goals for 2022. So I had a list of these sort of big achievements, which I wanted to achieve. And... I've ticked off quite a few of them. There's a few more to go. And I think it is a lot of them are achievable by the end of the year. But some of them I've just realistically been like, okay, no, that's that's not going to happen. Do you mind sharing some of the ones you've ticked off? Absolutely not. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> so one of them was to, uh, I was hitting a, oh yeah, it was hit, hit a million on Instagram. So I did that. I wanted to launch a podcast, done that. Well, I've filmed a few, but I haven't launched it yet. I'll be launched in a couple of weeks. I wanted to launch a bikini line for, the, for my clothing brand, did that. Uh, I wanted to get a certain number of people signed up to my app by the summer. I didn't achieve that. It was, that's actually like quite interesting how hard it is to get people to just part with nine pound a month. But I think there's just an abundance of fitness apps at the moment where it's actually quite difficult. Um, and uh, I've got a, a course which I want to launch at the end of this year, which has not been done yet, but it definitely can be done. Do you want to divulge what that is? Is it a sneak peek or...? Um, no, because you might steal it. No, no, no. <laughs> well, you can keep it, keep that one to yourself then. Well, there, there's um, one which I was quite interested in doing is a uh, like a hypertrophy masterclass because I think like one of the things which I'm known for is my form and technique. And because unfortunately at this point I'm so busy, I can't do the one-to-one -one personal training sessions anymore. So I'm trying to think like, well, what is the next best thing to have me as a coach? I have the app, which is basically one of the best apps you can have in terms of the programming so you know what programs you should follow in order to get the results you want but a lot of people struggle to actually dial down their technique so i thought about doing this course which i go into extreme depth into every single exercise and how to execute it properly 
which will definitely help people for sure. And then there was another lifestyle course, which I think I probably just need to do a little bit more research on, um, which is almost kind of like a how to escape the nine to five and live your sort of dream life and create your own business. And it would help people to improve their social media, their marketing, uh, their ability to make money and so on. But I feel like there's a few areas which I actually need to improve my own uh, skill set in before I can start teaching it. Because I hate to teach things which I don't fully understand. So I'm going through a phase at the moment where I'm just trying to develop some of my skills outside of fitness, particularly when it comes to sales and marketing and just generally understanding money and how to make money. But um, I think that's, there's, there's certainly a lot of room for making money with those kinds of things. And I think I got quite a lot of inspiration from what Mark was doing with his um, coaching concierge. Because I know I've got a lot of followers now and there's a lot of people who just, they want to have access to me. So I was thinking of doing some some form of a meetup or seminar over maybe a two day period out here in Dubai where people, you know, we get together, we can all learn from each other. They can learn from me. I can get some guests to speak. And I think that would be a really cool sort of networking event and just a, a learning event as well. Yeah, smart move. And that's why recently I, well, a couple months ago, I set up a seven-figure scaling system as like a fitness mm. mastermind because there's a huge amount of trainers out there in terms of who want to like learn to be able to build their own businesses and live on life on their own terms and also help people over the world. But there's a real lack of guidance from people like you and me who have actually done that. Mm. And I think a lot of the people who are selling this stuff are just selling shit. Yeah, actually, yeah. Like people are selling online like coaching, but they've never had an online coaching business themselves. Yeah. And for me, that's a complete like fallacy because you're not true to your values and you haven't actually walked the walk. It's like you selling fitness plans all over the world, yet you're like, you've never been in shape in your life. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like you being a certified online coach, yet you've never trained someone in person before. Yeah. It's like, how, how, how do you know how to coach people? I feel like training people in person is almost like an essential, which you need to master before you can start teaching it. 100%. I think for me, I even see that when I see people in the gym, I forget sometimes, even a lot of experience, that certain people, some might not be able to do a back squat, some might be able to do a walking lunge. And you forget when you're very advanced that people can't necessarily do these basic motor patterns yet. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. And the, even in Dubai, there's literally no barriers to entry to being a personal trainer. And there's a hell of a lot of terrible personal trainers out there. And I, I feel as though it's, this is one of the, I wouldn't say it's annoying, but it's, it's frustrating. Like on a daily basis, there's so many people that will message me saying like, oh, Mike, I'm coming to Dubai. Like it'd be great if we can get a session in. And I, I just don't have the time to do that. Even if I was charging, it's not something I do anymore. So I, I feel, I feel bad when I, I kind of have to let them down and just tell them like, look, I'm, I don't do this anymore but um you know it, it, it is what it is the uh dubai personal training scene is like the wild west i find it ironic that you walk into certain gyms like bernice for example and i see like half of them are injured with like, their arms and like slings run crutches and i'm like probably says a lot to what's going on here yeah yeah and there's there's this uh, you can just you just see it it's it, they're just they're looking at their their client who's going through the the reps and the sets and they're, they're like i look at the form and i'm just like holy shit like this is this is really bad or this exercise is a comp this is a waste of time exercise, or that they've just got they're trying to lift way too much weight, and it's just a recipe for disaster. But no one's really kind of policing it in in Dubai. I think you, you don't even need to show any paperwork. You don't need to even have an agreement with the gym. You can literally, as long as you pay for a membership in the gym and the client pays for the membership, you can do whatever you want inside of the gym. Free reign. Coming into your own training. People are always fascinated about you in terms of how you stay in shape all year round and whilst traveling and enjoying yourself, obviously, and I'll be other stuff you've been doing. What is the secret that, to what you do with that? Is there a certain like nutrition approach you use? Is it fasting? I think you've mentioned that before sometimes. Like, how do you keep yourself in such good shape? I think it's because I've, particularly in my, my 20s, I used to be so anal with everything. I used to track all my macros, count calories. And from doing that, day after day, week after week, year after year, it, it becomes ingrained in my brain to, to almost know, okay, well, this is what I need to eat. Or if I eat this, this is the results which I'm going to get. So I know roughly how much protein I should be getting in. I can gauge it just by looking at it. And I know just not to overeat. I think overeating for sure is one of those things which, I mean, obviously I, I, I don't get out of shape, but I definitely notice less definition. So it requires a lot of discipline, particularly when all your friends, if they're out drinking beer or people are ordering desserts or people are just getting like unnecessary sides. I know just 
say no not today like i'm not gonna have that and i will almost always regarding regardless of how i feel i will go to the gym like even if i feel like crap if i feel like tired i will still go to the gym even i remember this was the ridiculous scenario in saint tropez there was a gym there but it was like must have been about a 40 minute drive away from the place i was staying the taxi situation was horrendous i didn't have a car so there was a couple of occasions where i had to ring up a chauffeur company to pick me up in this big van just to take me to the gym and the whole trip to go to the gym and back would cost me like 160 euros. But I was like, I don't care. Like, I want to go to the gym that badly that I'm prepared to pay this extortionate price just to get to the gym. So it's, it's a combination of just being disciplined with how much I'm eating, knowing the right things to eat, and just being extremely consistent with going to the gym. That story just reminded me of when I went to uh, Ivalo in Finland, that's in like the Arctic Circle. And... They had like basically no food in this place. You know, like it's like the ice igloos where you can look up and see the Northern Lights and that stuff. They had like no food. They had like protein. And like for three days, I was like, what the fuck am I going to do? So I ended up having to get a taxi to the supermarket and it cost me a hundred pounds to get a taxi yeah. there. hundred pounds to get back just to be able to buy like protein bars and other stuff just so I had something to eat. But that's where like, I wasn't willing to go three, four days eating like minimal rations of food. So I was going to waste away. And I think... Mm-hmm. That's probably very much like a, a bit of OCD, but a bit of a mindset thing in terms of like you take things seriously and like fitness is an important part of your life, even for you as you're like building other areas in terms of your business and your mindset, like this is always a core value for you. Yeah. Uh, it, even I notice if I don't go to the gym for a couple of days, I feel really uncomfortable and stressed out. And I, I think it's, the gym is something which I need. It's, it's that release that I need. It's like a, almost like a meditation for me. And I guess it's just, it's, it's such a, an ingrained habit that I've been following. I've been training for 14 years. So for me to not do it just feels so foreign and strange. Like I just don't like it. What's the longest time you've ever had, had off training? It was, I think it was, it was 10 days. It was when I had a hair transplant. So the doctor was like, well, you should probably shouldn't go to the gym for like two weeks. And I was like, Jesus Christ, like that's that's a long time. But obviously I didn't want to mess up the procedure in case all my hair freaking fell out. So there was there was a 10 day period in London where I didn't go to the gym. I maybe went out and about and, and walked for a bit, but that was, it was it was surprising. It was really difficult to, to experience that. And I felt like, first of all, I had a lot more free time because usually the gym would probably take up like getting there back training would take out like two hours of my day. So I was like, oh, I've got like an extra two hours in the day. But I had all this like excess energy, which I couldn't get rid of. And I noticed that by not going to the gym, my eating habits just went to shit. Like I was just uh, not even really caring about what I was putting into my body. So it's, it's weird because when I go to the gym and I'm in this healthy routine of training and exercising, it naturally just makes me also want to eat healthy as well. And I feel like it's, it's weird, like life is just so easy when you're not pushing yourself or you're not being uncomfortable. When you don't put yourself through that pleasant sensation of feeling the muscles burn or whatever it might be, life just feels like a breeze. You, you need that You need that discomfort. You need to be able to push yourself. And I think I, I even missed the endorphin rush you would get after a workout. For me, that's what I love about life. And it's, I'm probably super sadistic and got screw loose. Like competing at the weekend, last three days had zero grams of carbohydrates, like 1400 calories. Mm-hmm. They am super happy because I've got some food. But like, for me, it's like, sometimes I just like pushing myself. It's like, how fucking uncomfortable can I make myself? Yeah. And then it's like the mental test of like, okay, when you go back to normal life, it's a piece of piss. Like yeah. when you're used to running on fumes and you can still operate and then when you suddenly like, you're not doing endless amounts of cardio or eating nothing, like the world becomes easy. And I think that's where people sometimes don't realize how far they can push themselves and they like really bottleneck their progress in life overall because they set limiting beliefs of what they can do. Even like a lot of people are like, oh, I haven't got time to work out. I haven't got time to X, Y, I haven't got time to go to the gym, but it's ultimately it's them not being organized or prioritizing things. Yeah, I think there's definitely a relationship with how how uncomfortable you can make yourself is going to directly make you happier or feel better after you've done it. I, I don't often do this, but when I when I do some really horrible like hit training or circuit training with like a, a crazy training partner, when I do it, I literally hate it so much. I'm like, this is so disgusting and unpleasant. I'm just not enjoying this. But when it's done, I am on a high all day for the rest of the day. It's crazy. So I'm actually actively trying to do at least one of those sessions a week. Not only for that feeling of feeling amazing, but I know that doing circuit training cardio is, is, is actually going to be good for my overall health and conditioning. Do you think your training is going to change over the next few years as you age respectfully? Well, I've actually made a video about this recently. Um, I, I have noticed now at the age of 32, I have less energy than I used to. 
in like my mid twenties. And I notice um, it, whether I, if I kill myself in the gym or I've done like two or three consecutive days of training, my, my body is telling me you need to rest. Like you, otherwise you're just gonna run yourself into the ground. So I've put a lot more priority and emphasis on rest days. Uh, whereas back in the day, I used to just go for it like like almost every single day. And now I don't really do ever do one rep maxes or three rep maxes because it just it doesn't really make sense. The ratio of risk to the reward is just not worth it. And anytime I have done one rep maxes or I've attempted to do it, I end up just injuring myself. So for me, I'm all about longevity. I want to be able to do this for as long as I possibly can do, and I want to look as good as I possibly can do long into the future. Um, but in terms of exercise selection and things like that. That hasn't really changed a huge amount. I would, I guess I would just say that I've become a hell of a lot smarter. I know now what I need to do in order to look a certain way. And I actually realized that I don't have to kill myself in order to do it. Like I would used to push myself to fa failure on every single set, every single exercise. And I realized I actually don't need to do that. Maybe, you know, on the last set of a particular exercise, if I push, if I have that one all out crazy set, that's actually enough. And training with Dorian actually taught me a lot because when I did the sessions with him, the, the actual volume in terms of the number of sets we did in the session, it wasn't a huge amount. It wasn't a huge amount of exercises, but it was just like a, a an all out crazy set, which it would, I mean, you need a training partner to do it, but if you do it properly, the, the damage is done. Like that's that's all you need to do. Like what, now that session's out of the way, all you have to do is just focus on recovery. And that's why he trained like four times a week and he didn't, he, he, well, he physically couldn't train more than that because he pushed himself so hard, but he needed to spend those other days recovering and actually building new muscle tissue. I think it's one of those things where people are all like gas pedal and no brake. Like mm -hmm. people just hammer themselves into the ground and they don't understand that you don't build muscle, burn body fat in the gym. It's outside of the gym. That's yeah. what actually really counts. And I, I've got a few people who message me that they're on my app and they're, they've chosen like a five day split and they're saying, oh, I want to add uh, another routine so I can do like six days or I want to train every day. And I'm like, if, if you are training every day, like you, you are either not training hard enough or you're very soon going to realize that you're going to burn out and you're not going to see any progress. Even to give an example, the competition I've got the weekend and another one in a couple of weeks from Romania, my training scale back I only trained four days a week now, whereas you train five. Because the more fatigue accumulation you get and the leaner you get, the less your body can start to take as much like stress and tolerance on it. Whereas people have the other mindset in terms of like, oh, I want to get leaner, I need to train more, I need to train more, I need to do more volume. Where in reality, it's actually the other way around. And that like extra cortisol in your body is actually like stunting fat loss more. Yeah, for sure. And I, I noticed the session I always have after a rest day is usually like the best session like my ability to have a pump and just focus and lift heavier weight. So um, it's definitely quality over quantity. Do you ever get fed up of people asking, is Mike Thurston natural? Because I know that's about <laughs> the most common question you probably get asked every fucking day. Yeah, I mean, I've been getting that for at least a decade now. And it, it's not so much I'm bothered about the accusations because in a sense it's a compliment. But I think the thing that annoys me is when people accuse me of lying. Because I've, I've mentioned it a few times on podcasts when people ask me, I tell them the truth. I'm like, no, I've never taken anything. And then people are just like, oh no, he's lying. 100% he's lying. And even now when I do a video on YouTube, which is on the topic of training, all the comments are just like, oh yeah, stero steroids, fake Trend. nutty, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, Jesus Christ. Like, I, And I don't know if there's, I, I would love if there was just a, um, a test you could do, just one single test which could just prove everything. But there's not, unfortunately. And even now, if you were to do a test, it doesn't necessarily prove that you've never taken anything before. So I've, I'm quite interested with what Matt has been doing. He's been doing random uh, blood tests and checkups, which has been supervised by uh, Derek for more plates, more dates. And there's always gonna be people that will just be like, oh no, still just don't believe him, like it's all rigged or whatever it might be. But at least he's made a conscious effort to go ahead with it. And you know, you can't fault him for that. And it's something which I would actually like to do next year when I'm in Dubai, I'm not going to be traveling. I'll be here for like four or five months. If somebody can just supervise the whole thing, come around, do all the tests and whatever. And at the same time, I go to the gym and almost treat that period of time like I'm competing so that I can get tested whilst I am in the peak condition, which is comparable to how, you know, I was looking my best in my 20s. Maybe it's going to satisfy a few people and I have some evidence then to back up my claims. But there's, I know there's still just going to be people who are just like, no, he's not. Like, there's no way he can be natural. And some, when some people have that opinion, it's very difficult for them, for you to change their mind. I've seen lots of other people like I was Simeon Pando make a video where he did all the tests saying, oh, I'm natural. And then people just like gave him a load of shit. So it's weird because if I go down the route of trying to really state like I am natural, I've never taken anything. I think I would end up getting more hate than anything else. So it's one of those things where I try and just batter off and be like, oh, you know what, I, I don't want to make a thing of this. You know, I'd rather pe the attention be somewhere else. But it is, it's getting annoying now. And I, I don't want to have a reputation of being a liar. So at some point in the next year, I want to just 
d- get it all ironed out. Something I think was always a great example with you, if you look at like your physique hasn't massively drastically changed over the last few years, respectfully, mm. and I don't think your body weight's really changed much, has it? No, the, the body weight has been, I kind of sit around th- 92, 93 kilograms, and it doesn't really change from that. Um, I've gone through periods where I put on a little bit more body fat, but most of the time I usually just don't, I'm not going to put up the pictures where I look <laughs> fat and unusual. And I'm very lucky with where I distribute my body fat. The majority of it is definitely stored in my thighs, uh, back of my legs and my lower back. I've naturally not stored much body fat on my abs at all, which is a good thing. And you can even see this from the pictures, you know, when I was younger and even a picture when I was like 10 years old, like even when I used to play rugby uh, and we went on rugby tour, I was like the youngest guy in the rugby tour and there was guys who were a year above me, two years above me. And they used to look at me and be like, what the hell is this like? What is this kid doing? Like he had a six pack before he even started doing anything. So I've, I've, I don't claim and say, oh yeah, the reason I look the way I look is because of you know the way I train. Like I train harder than the rest of you guys or I'm more disciplined than the rest of you guys. That's not the truth. I, I do, I train hard and I'm disciplined, but I'm fucking lucky with my genetics. And you know, I, if I had bad genetics or my genetics were not as good, I, I'd, I wouldn't be doing this for a living. Or the, the, the fit, I wouldn't have gone down the fitness route. I would have gone and done something else for sure. And it's one of those things you play the cards you're dealt, right? Yeah. Like your strength is you look great, like you're in awesome shape. So you push that because that's the avenue you're going to have the most success. It's like, yeah. I'm never going to be a mathematician because math isn't necessarily my strongest point, not to have a limiting belief. But you, you would push to what you're really good at and what you actually enjoy and what your zone of genius is. Actually, interesting, if I said to you, like, what's your zone of genius, the one thing that you think like you're the best at, what would that be? I think definitely the, the way I look for sure is it stands out from the crowd. And it certainly did back in the day when there was less people doing the whole fitness thing. But I think, um, I guess one, or what I believe has, has, has been a factor that's helped me you know, grow my, my YouTube channel and so on. It's just being pretty down to earth and just, I've not let fame or the following uh, that I have change me as a person. I feel like I'm I don't know, it sounds weird, but I, I, I'm, I, maybe I'm more likable than other people. Maybe I'm just like down to earth and I don't take myself too seriously. I think that's an attribute which has helped quite a bit. Because I think a lot of people, they when they initially see me or they don't know who I am, they've seen a few clips or maybe they look at my Instagram. Initially, they will they will just think the worst. They were like, this guy, it looks like this, so he's probably going to be a massive dickhead. But when somebody actually gets to know me, a lot of the time, they're pleasantly surprised. And the same time when I meet girls and stuff, when I go on a date for the first time, the, the girl always has this, this worst case scenario of what I'm going to be like. And they're prepared to meet some douchebag. But then I actually sit down, have a com- conversation with them. I listen to them. I can articulate, have a conversation, crack some jokes. I don't take myself too seriously. I'm like, oh, he's actually a really nice guy. So... I think that's, I'd, I'd much rather people be pleasantly surprised than people to meet me and just be disappointed. Do you find it difficult that sometimes you almost have to always be on guard about how the way you carry yourself, particularly in public, because a lot of people know who you are? I think so. I guess it depends because I, in my videos, I'm, that's who I am naturally. So how I'll behave in the street is going to be, you know, people will expect that. I think it's always been very important if I do get approached and people want to speak to me, I'll, I always make time to whether it be get a photo or just have like a small conversation. Even when there's been times when I just, I don't really want to, or it's literally so inappropriate. Literally the other day I was getting a haircut and I was lying down in the barber chair, like my head all the way back, looking at the ceiling. And some guy had a razor blade to my uh, beard. He was trimming my beard. And some guy must have seen me next to the window as he was walking past and he comes into the shop and he's like, oh, hey Mike, can I get a photo? And I'm literally lying there like with the, all covered up this guy cut my head. I'm like, now is probably not a good time. So I think a lot of people, they don't have this sense of, okay, this is not a good time to bother him. Maybe I'll wait until you know he's done what he needs to do. Then I'll approach him. Um, whereas other people, most of the time they have something really nice to say. And that's one of the things why it kind of continues to make me do the things which I'm, I'm doing at the moment. There's not only a lot of people who've said, you know, oh, thank you, you've inspired me to go to the gym or I've lost like 20 kilograms. But the ones which I think is more impressive and makes me happy is when people say, do you know what? I've actually, I've quit my job and I'm now living my dream, doing the thing which I want to do. And I moved to Dubai because of you. And I'm like, wow, that's actually, that's pretty powerful. But um, yeah, I, I don't feel like there's a responsibility for me to act a certain way. But what I would say now is because I'm definitely a lot more known than I used to be, I don't like being under the influence of alcohol or anything else because I don't want to be seen drunk. and I don't want to be seen acting like a little bit too crazy. Not that I am too crazy, but I know for sure when I'm drunk, I'm certainly not myself. 
I'm definitely a lot more looser, but um, I, I don't really want people to see me like that. I think when we spoke a couple of weeks ago, you mentioned you were going to go teetotal and, total and cut alcohol completely. Is that still something you're continuing with? Yeah. Um, I, I literally have no interest in drinking at the moment. And I've noticed that even just by staying away from it a lot more than I used to, even when I do drink and have like two or three drinks, like I'm literally so pissed. <laughs> like I, 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 I don't like it. I feel like I'm out of control and even I would say things which I wouldn't normally say and I'm just like I, I, I just don't like it at all that I think alcohol the moment you drink alcohol and have a lot of it is you're just welcoming so many bad habits into your life and whenever I do drink I end up having the worst sleep I wake up the next day uh, my mood is depressed a little bit the, the training session is not very good I have cravings for bad food and then I, I just feel so unproductive I don't want to do anything so I, I just think for the, for the small moment of potential happiness that it may provide in a couple of hours it's not worth the aftermath the following day where you you can almost waste a day and i've had many days which i've just wasted due to being hung over and um maybe it's it's a combination of me maturing and wanting different things but also as i'm getting older i feel like it definitely hits you harder you know being 32 compared to when you're 22 i'd 100 agree with that and i think that's very much a lot of that's like you switching your thinking in terms of short-term gratification in terms of long-term gratifications probably and i think as we get older you realize like not i'm running out of time but like time goes quickly the years fly by that like i need to hit the ground hard now and like make the most of every moment because and i don't want to be spending half yeah. a day hung over in bed achieving nothing yeah and i think back in the day when i used to drink it was because it would make me feel more confident and more relaxed because when i would you know it, being a little bit more introverted before going to an event it, i'd feel a bit anxious and i knew that I would, I would have to speak to lots of people lots of people wanted to speak to me and i would feel like the alcohol would just calm the nerves and make me feel a little bit more loose but now I'm a completely different person and I actually prefer to be 100% sober because when I'm sober that's when my brain is like really firing fast I can articulate myself have a good conversation and more importantly I want to be able to remember any conversation which I have with somebody so I much prefer to be sober now than to be you know under the influence say a couple of things which I wouldn't usually say maybe potentially forget a conversation and you know like i said meant f waste the following day now obviously you're living in dubai do you feel settled here and do you think you're gonna be here for good or could you self -living, see yourself living anywhere else in the world i think dubai is always going to be a, a base for me you know particularly for the next five years and i feel like it's just becoming an even more popular place for people to live or for people to visit so for people like us, it's an amazing opportunity to network with other people, whether it be tourists or just like celebrities or people just coming in and out. And I like that because I feel like it's always it's always fresh. It's, you're never seeing the same faces. It's always new people coming in and out. So I feel like that's great. And then um, just the lifestyle, the quality of life, the gyms. Even when I've, you know, I've got my own, it's, I don't own the apartment, but hopefully soon I will own an apartment. But that's, you know, I've got a nice home, nice view. I've got my routine. And the longer you've been here, the more people I know. So I feel like... All my networks are here, so for sure. But I, I, I do realize that if whenever I'm in Dubai for too long, it starts to drive me a little bit insane and I have to just leave for a bit. Maybe not too long, but just go somewhere which is almost like the complete opposite of Dubai. You know, you go to, to Bali or just somewhere which is just, you're in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by nature and there's no materialistic things. There's no manic rush of people running around everywhere. Just to kind of unwind and I guess be at one with nature and then come back and I feel recharged. And whenever I take that break during the summertime, which I will always continue to do when it gets too hot, being away for even two months, I start to really miss Dubai. And I'm like, God, I, I literally can't wait to come back. Like when I came back this year after traveling around Europe, I was so happy to be back. And I don't know if that was because I was just happy to be back in Dubai or just happy to be back in my good routine. It's 100% I felt the same after being in Marbella for the summer in the UK for a little bit. I couldn't mm. wait to get back. I, I can't really think of anywhere that matches it there's i've tried spain then it's just it's just not this everyone in spain is just like really chilled out and lazy and obviously a lot of people speak spanish i don't speak spanish so that's a little bit of an issue sometimes london is london is just a bit of a mess now maybe la or miami i don't know i thought bali is potentially a place where i could live but i feel again it's just a little bit too chilled out and um it is still like a it's not a fully economically developed country so it is you know, uh, it doesn't have the infrastructure there yet. So it's, it's quite annoying, um, even just getting around, things like that. What does the future hold for Mike Thurston? What, what What's next? Obviously, you've got the podcast coming up. What are the big goals you could set for yourself in the next two, three years? I think... I just want to, I want to just continue to grow, improve my, my brand, my image, and just start making a little bit more money, I think. Like, I'm, I'm doing good for money, but I want to get to the level 
that these other guys are on. So certainly will involve less traveling. It will involve more just keeping my head down. And like I said before, doing the things which I know are actually going to help and be useful. Um, bring out a couple of courses, uh, do these like hopefully amazing collaborations, whether it be on YouTube or the podcast. And just, yeah, overall, my brand, I just want it to grow. And then potentially two years down, three years down, I can start releasing some more of my own products. But, you know, at this stage, I don't necessarily want to do that because it's going to be a little bit more of a distraction for me. So I need to just dial down on some of the things which are really working for me and just really make sure that they excel. One of my favorite sayings is singularity of focus. And then yeah. the last question I have for you, which I like to ask everyone is what piece of advice would give your 18 year old self if you could talk to them right now? Oh, <laughs> I would probably just say, do not neglect your social media, like get on that as soon as possible and get on every single social media because I had no idea how important it would be. I mean, you see it now, like everybody is on it. And I think even just the, the sooner that I could get started, I would have been in, in an even better off position. It's a great answer. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time today, Mike. No I hope everyone actually loves the podcast. Make sure you leave us a five-star review and subscribe. Check out Mike's podcast, which is coming out soon. What's the name of the podcast? I haven't even got the name yet. We haven't got that far yet. But he's got some episodes recorded. So uh, check it out whenever Mike drops live. I hope you guys enjoy this and check out the new podcast episode soon.